Now I want to move on a little bit um, and introduce another great figure of the 19th century, one that's almost certainly known to all of you. Where did the fossils of Megatherium come from? Well, they came from South America. Um, Buckland's own specimen came from Paraguay. You won't see it in England, the actual specimen that he described now resides in Spain. But many of the key fossils of Megatherium were found by this man. This is Charles Robert Darwin. And many of you know that later in the 19th century, Charles Darwin hypothesized uh, and put together a, a theory, the theory of evolution by natural selection, that many regard as successful in blowing the design argument for the existence of God out of the water. And I'd like to talk a little bit about Darwin and my own reflections on him. Darwin, and this point's often missed, actually started out in life as a profoundly religious, well not a profoundly religious man, as a religious man. He was, he was certainly committed to belief that there was a God, God existed. When he studied at Cambridge University, this college, King's College, Cambridge, he actually studied as a clergyman. He was due to become ordained and go into the Church of England. Uh, he wanted to have a rural parish and lead a quiet, peaceful life, sharing the odd sermon on a Sunday and doing very little else. He was an extremely idle man at that particular point in his life. But while he was at Cambridge, he read a lot of William Paley's works. And he was thoroughly persuaded in William Paley's watchmaker argument. He was thoroughly convinced by the argument that we see all around us evidences of design, and those evidences point to the existence of God. William Paley's uh, works, as I said, were a part of the core curriculum at Cambridge University, so Darwin had to read them, but he also delighted in reading them and learned much of Paley's works by heart. But then something changed. What changed was that Darwin had the opportunity to go on board a ship called HMS Beagle and go on a round-the-world voyage. That voyage took him all over the globe between 1831 and 1836. And when he was on that voyage, his ideas started to change. Darwin actually ended up on that voyage partly as a result of luck. He went on that voyage as a companion to the captain. Back in the 19th century, the captain belonged to the upper crust, one of the upper classes, and the captain wasn't permitted to have very much to do with his crew who belonged to the lower classes. So it was extremely lonely for a captain going on a round-the-world voyage. A captain literally had no one to talk to, no one he could call his friend, no one he could make polite dinner conversation with in the evenings. And that's why Darwin got on board HMS Beagle. He went in order to give the captain companionship so the captain wouldn't be driven to, uh, to distraction by his loneliness. Uh, wouldn't be uh, driven to suicide, as many captains in the 19th century were. Actually, Captain Fitzroy uh, was never very far away from uh, his suicidal tendencies um, and was a, a bit of a nutter in all kinds of respects. But Darwin ended up sailing around the world with Captain Fitzroy and the crew for five years. And during that time, his ideas about nature started to change quite radically. When he came back, he had in place the main principles of his evolutionary theory. And over the next 20 years, he worked on that evolutionary theory. In 1859, he published his famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. One of the most significant books ever published in the English language. I highly recommend it to you. It's a readable book, although much of the language is quite old-fashioned. In this book, Darwin puts forward an argument that many regard as directly contradicting the idea that God is responsible for the appearance of design in nature. I know you study the argument of GCSE biology, but it's worth rehearsing it with you. Darwin's starting point was the observation that within any population of living creatures, we find variation. Creatures vary in terms of their size, weight, color, in terms of how many offspring they're able to have, in terms of their behaviors. And Darwin said some of this variation is heritable. In other words, it can be passed down from parent to offspring. The variation can be passed down the generations. Darwin said in addition to all this, there's what he called a struggle for existence. Animals struggle in order to get territory, in order to find mates, in order to get food, uh, in order to get water. Plants struggle with one another in order to get minerals, in order to get light. And this struggle for existence, Darwin says, results in a selective process operating in nature. He called it the process of natural selection. And the process of natural selection working over eons of geological time can result in one population of living organisms becoming changed into quite a different kind of population of living organisms altogether. Let's just see how this might apply to my favorite example, Megatherium. Let's imagine that at some point in the distant past there was a population of Megatherium. With any population of living creatures you find variation. 
And these megatheriums varied in terms of their body size. Some were larger than others. Now let's say, using Darwin's language, that body size confers a selective advantage, that large megatherium are more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass on their characteristics to the next generation. As a result of that process of selection taking place, the next generation of megatheriums is going to be slightly larger than the previous generation on average. Now within that population of megatheriums, you again have variation. Some are larger than others. And those megatheriums are more likely to survive, reproduce, pass their characteristics onto the next generation. And so the process of natural selection continues over eons of geological time. And as this process continues, you end up with the average size of a megatherium becoming larger and larger and larger until you end up with a creature 5.2 metres in height, the kind of creature that Buckland was describing when he did his Holywell lecture at Oxford University all those years ago. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection seemed very persuasive to many people in the 19th century when he published his thesis in 1959, 1859. But Darwin had a problem, a significant problem. He devoted a whole chapter to it in his book. The problem was what he called organs of extreme perfection and complication. We're back to Paley's own example of the eye. It's considerate, Darwin said. He wrote these words in his book, The Origin of Species. Does suppose that the eye, with, his all, well, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. Darwin saw the problem with this theory. The problem was, how can you explain the existence of such astonishingly high degrees of complexity with reference to my theory of evolution by natural selection? It was a real problem for Darwin, and it remained a problem to his dying day. But in the 20th century, biologists took on the eye challenge and put forward a possible scenario that explains how the eye, in all of its complication, all of its perfection, could have come about as a result of a purely natural process in the way that Darwin suggested. And the explanation goes something like this. Let's imagine an ancestral population of creatures, and they've got a layer of light-sensitive cells those light-sensitive cells contain a pigment. When light falls on the pigment, it changes in terms of its chemical structure and sends electrical impulses through the organism's body. Electrical impulses. This is a very primitive kind of eye. Technically, it's called an eye spot. There are many creatures today that actually have eye spots on the surface of their body. Um, certain kinds of worms, leeches, for instance, um, have these eye spots, and they enable a creature to, to detect when they're in light and when they're in shadow. That would give these creatures some kind of selective advantage. But let's imagine, with Darwin, that there's variation within this population of ancestral creatures. And some of these creatures develop a different design of the eye spot altogether. And this design starts to adopt a concave shape. This would clearly be a tremendous advantage to any creature that possesses that kind of light spot. Because now it can detect not just the difference between light and shadow, day and night, it can also detect the direction that light is traveling in. In this particular instance, light rays are shown with straight lines. Only these cells at the bottom of the concave dish are going to send electrical impulses. So the creature has some kind of idea where the light is coming from. And again, we find this kind of primitive eye design in living creatures. We find it in limpets, for instance. Now let's imagine the design becomes more complex. As time goes by, again, variation exists within any population of living creatures. Some creatures could well come into existence that have a still more concave version of an eye spot. This creature is still not able to form an image, but it possesses what we might call a pinhole camera style of eye. Many of you have looked at pinhole cameras in your physics GCSE courses, I know. And the pinhole camera style of eye is more effective than the previous design for detecting the direction that light is coming from. We find this kind of design of eye in the Nautilus today. Now let's imagine that within any, within any population, variation exists, some organisms, produce 
variations on this feature that have a particular kind of mucus or a particular kind of liquid coating, the light sensitive cells at the back of the eye, this offers them protection. Again, we may suppose that this gives these kinds of organisms a selective advantage over organisms that don't have that layer of mucus. Uh, we find this kind of eye in the marine snail. Let's imagine that that mucus then comes in time to fill the entirety of the eye protecting it still further. We find that kind of thing in what we call the abalone, another kind of primitive sea creature. And over time, that mucus fills, uh, filling the eye becomes something called a humor, and the humor becomes thicker at the front of the eye, forming a rudimentary lens. It's thinner at the back of the eye, where it still affords the light uh, sensitive cells a degree of protection. We find that kind of eye in the octopus today. And so we can show how by degrees, Something as complex, even as the eye, was able to evolve by a process of natural selection. A purely natural process that makes no reference whatsoever to supreme intelligence or to a god. And at each point in the development of this extremely complex structure, each version of the eye is useful to the organism that possesses it. Where does this leave us today? It leaves us today with the kinds of arguments that are used not by Paley, by this man, Richard Dawkins, who in his book, published in 1986, refers to what he calls the blind watchmaker. There is no divine watchmaker. There is no God who has plans and purposes for his creation. All we can talk about is a purely natural process, the process of natural selection, which alone is responsible for nature and all of its glorious complexity and diversity. This is the thesis of his book. And in the words of one of his colleagues at Oxford University, Professor Peter Atkins, professor of chemistry, there seems nothing left for an infinitely lazy creator to do. We can explain everything in nature without reference to God. Why believe in God any longer? The God hypothesis is completely redundant. In fact, anyone who believes in the God hypothesis is deluded to make reference to one of Dawkins' later books. Towards the end of his life, Charles Darwin too confessed that he had lost his faith. He wrote in his autobiography, published after his death, the old argument from design in nature is given by Paley, which formerly seemed to me so conclusive fails. Now that the law of natural selection has been discovered, there seems to be no more design in the variability of organic beings and in the action of natural selection than in the course which the wind blows. In the eyes of many people, Darwin's great discovery of natural selection sparked a conflict between science and religion. In 1860, just a year after Darwin published his seminal work, there was a great debate that took place behind these doors in the, in the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. The debate took place on Saturday, the 30th of June, 1860. It was a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. The room behind those doors is closed off to the general public, but I've been in there once. As an undergraduate at Oxford, I went in, and I tried to imagine the room back on the 30th of June, 1860, when 700 people wedged themselves into that room in order to hear two of the intellectual giants of the day battle it out in debate, and here they are. At the top, Thomas Henry Huxley, nicknamed Darwin's Bulldog, the one who took Darwin's theory of natural selection out into the world and exposed it to a much wider audience. At the bottom, Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, the Bishop of Oxford, nicknamed Soapy Sam for his legendary ability to wriggle out of any difficult situations that he found himself in when he was in debate. Two brilliant speakers, two brilliant debaters, they went head to head on that day. And the first to speak was the bishop. The bishop ridiculed Darwin and his great disciple Huxley, pointing out that Darwin's arguments were fundamentally flawed, that natural selection couldn't possibly work, and then, in tones of icy sarcasm, he turned to Thomas Henry Huxley, who was on the stage next to him, and uttered these famous words. Tell me, sir, is it through your grandmother or your grandfather that you claim descent from an ape? At that point, Huxley clasped the knee of the surprised person sitting next to him and uttered, the Lord hath delivered him into my hands. Taking stage, he laid into the bishop's arguments. Working him up to a great climax, he said he would not be ashamed of having an ape as his ancestor, but he would be ashamed of a great man who delved into scientific mysteries of which he knew nothing. This was a direct insult to the clergy. You didn't do that kind of thing in the 19th century. The room was in uproar. Lady Brewster fainted. Captain Fitzroy of, the, of HMS Beagle held a Bible aloft, shouting that it, and it alone, was the true unimpeachable authority. The people 
people flew out of that room, went all over British society, and from that point on, the idea was cemented in the British consciousness that science and religion are at war with one another. Actually, I've got a problem with the version of events that I just gave to you. I've given you the popular version of events surrounding that great day in 1860. But it now transpires that the version of events that has entered the public consciousness is not quite what really happened. It seems that Huxley promoted a particular version of events that suited his purposes. We know he hated the clergy. In particular, he hated Wilberforce. Wilberforce died some years later by falling off his horse and sustaining severe head injuries. And Huxley was heard to say in response to hearing the news that the great Bishop of Oxford had died, for once reality and his brains came into contact and the result was fatal. What a thing to say about a clergyman. Let me make three observations. And here they are. The first is that Darwin's theory has not displaced or disprove the existence of God. What Darwin did in his book, The Origin of Species, was explain how the existence of nature and all of its complexity and diversity could come into existence as a result of a natural process. He replaced, if you like, a, des a, a design hypothesis with a natural hypothesis. But he didn't directly disprove the existence of God, nor did he mean to. Darwin, to his dying day, was not an atheist. In fact, in his autobiography, he said, I'm content to call myself an agnostic. He knew that his arguments had not disproved the existence of God. My second observation is this. The Bible doesn't argue for God's existence based on observation of nature. Yes, it's true that the Bible talks of our ability to perceive God's handiwork when we look at the works of nature. But the Bible puts its emphasis on the idea that God acts in human history, that God reveals himself in human history, in particular in the personal work of Jesus of Nazareth. There are, in other words, stronger reasons to believe in the existence of God than any design argument. And my third observation is this. Even in Darwin's day, natural selection was often interpreted in religious form as an instrument of God. And this is the point I'd like to explain in a little bit more detail. Throughout his lifetime, Darwin corresponded with very many people, about a thousand people in total. And of those thousand people that Darwin entered into letter correspondence with, around 200 were clergymen. Many of Darwin's closest friends were ordained members of the Church of England. One of them was a writer and theologian called Charles Kingsley, he wrote a book called The Water Babies that isn't read very widely today, but it's quite a well-known children's book. Darwin sent an advanced copy of his book, The Origin, to Charles Kingsley. Prior to its publication, Kingsley read it, he was so enthusiastic about it that he wrote a letter to Darwin, and Darwin was so pleased with the response that Kingsley gave to his work that he included a quote from Kingsley's letter in all future editions of The Origin of Species. So if you pick up any edition of The Origin of Species from the second edition onwards, and the book went through six editions in Darwin's own lifetime, you'll find in its pages this quote. Look at the top. I see no good reason why the views given in this volume should shock the religious feelings of anyone. A celebrated author and divine has written to me that he has gradually learned to see that it is just as noble a conception of the deity to believe that he created a few original forms capable of self-development into other and needful forms as to believe that he required a fresh act of creation to supply the voids caused by the action of his laws. This is what Kingsley was writing to Darwin, and this is the idea that Darwin was so attracted to. We can have two different conceptions of God, what God is like. On the one hand, we can have the idea that God creates as a result of miraculously intervening in the natural world. That God sees there are gaps that need filling, so God steps in and miraculously speaks a new species into existence. Well, there's a second view of God, the view of God that says that God doesn't miraculously intervene in nature, but God uses the physical laws governing the workings of nature in order to accomplish his purposes. Now says Kingsley, which of those two um, ideas of God is the more noble conception of the deity, the greater view of God? Kingsley said, I go with the second view. The view that God is actually using natural laws, the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, the laws of biology, in order to accomplish his creative purposes. That's a more noble conception of God than the idea that God needs to continually intervene in special ways, in miraculous ways, in order to fill gaps in nature. Darwin was very taken by this argument. 
And at the, nearing the end of his life, he wrote this letter to one of his correspondents. Dear sir, it seems to me absurd to doubt that a man may be an ardent theist and an evolutionist. In other words, someone can believe in both God and evolution. Many people call themselves theistic evolutionists, and I'm one of them. I believe that religious belief in God and the scientific belief in the power of evolution by natural selection actually go hand in hand. These two different explanations of nature actually complement one another. They're not at loggerheads with one another.